Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing the other screen now, so it would be okay. But let me ask quickly before I go back. Um, so can someone in chat say that they can see my screen? This one. Okay, okay, perfect. All right, so then let me go with this version. I may not go to full screen because, it, because then I lose looking at the application. All right, so let's get us started. Sorry about the confusion. Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about what we do at RBC and most specifically within capital markets and investment banking uh, in terms of utilizing data science, different data sets, big data to serve our clients. Um, so uh, this is um, hopefully going to be an exciting topic for you. I know that uh, most people are familiar with some of the other applications of AI in banking, like for example, credit card fraud detection or mortgage loan default prediction and things like that. And I wanted to keep this session a bit different and introduce you to some other concepts that you may not be familiar with, um, uh, similar to uh, the more traditional uh, use cases of AI in banking. Um, so um, I'm going to spend maybe uh, one minute introducing um, investment research for those of you who are not familiar with it. And then I go through some use cases and how we are utilizing data and data science AI um, to um, uh, improve our investment research. Um, so investment research is um, basically the work that is done uh, for the study of performance of stocks and, and uh, other asset classes and to produce a guide for investors what to invest on. So um, like if you think about pension funds, mutual funds, um, hedge funds, different organizations who invest the money on behalf of their clients and if they want to um, decide what securities, what stocks to buy, what stocks to sell, this is where we try to help them with making those decisions. Um, this uh, business investment research was around for a long time um, and it provides the market with timely information regarding um, uh, like, uh, again, the investment decisions that people have to make. Um, so in terms of history, um, basically, uh, a lot of banks started delivering what we call investment research on securities. And it was a very traditional business that started with sending research through mail to investors, to clients, and then like transformed to, okay, let's uh, make it digital and let's provide all of the investment research in more real time to clients through different digital platforms like what we have in RBC, which is a uh, digital platform for investors. So this is basically uh, how it transformed so far. But in the last five to 10 years, there has been a greater transformation by the introduction of um, data science, AI, and what we call it alternative data. Alternative data is anything outside of banking and financial data that you, uh, we may utilize to predict what is going to happen to different stocks and different asset classes, like if you think about the oil market, you think about commodities, other uh, metals, gold, silver, etc. So anything that we use to forecast what is going to happen to different markets, and we use data that is not financial data, we call that alternative data. Um, so again, um, going back to a few examples that I'm going to talk about today, um, um, I have example from looking at supply chain disruptions by alternative data through the lens of alternative data, quantifying central bank communications. And when I talk about each one of these use cases, I will talk why it is important, how it will impact the end user, which is again, our clients who are institutional investors who are 
pension funds, clients like um, hedge funds and so on. Um, another application, another example is predicting um, loan balances of banks, understanding price elas elasticity between different products. Um, an example of a standalone data product, geospatial and satellite imagery, social media insights. And again, um, like I want to show that how broad this industry could be from different types of data sources that we can utilize, as well as different types of um, AI and machine learning and data science techniques that we can apply to get to uh, interesting insights. So let's get started with the first example. This is something that um, like we um, actually uh, Publish so the way that our we deliver our uh, insights to clients is again through our digital platform through publishing and some um, like uh, some of these would be applications that clients directly can interact with and get insights. This is something that we published actually a few days ago. We looked into quantifying the pace of global supply chain disruption and when you think about it, global supply chain defines everything, almost everything that you buy. Um, like you've probably come across a lot of delays or uh, when you when you ordered something that was caused by the supply chain disruption or you may have uh, seen that prices have been up uh, again because there, there has been so many delays, demand is so high and um, supply is being disrupted. So basically here we are uh, leveraging geospatial intelligence which is a combination of different signals, for example, satellite imagery to track ports. Uh, ship AIS data, every ship has, uh, is sending a lot of information uh, which we can track on a real time to understand where they are or what uh, uh, the ship is um, uh, carrying and uh, where they stand and uh, how many days they had to wait at a port for them to um, uh, basically uh, get their items to, to that location. And uh, basically, um, the, the other part of geospatial is, is foot traffic. Like we can um, really have an index of how many people are in each location. And it may sound scary, but, but it is true cell phone pings, a lot of applications that we install on our mobiles, um, um, they track our location. And we are able to actually, uh, through different uh, platforms and um, media to see how many or or have an approximation of how many people are where. Um, so again, this this in this example, we looked into um, like 22 um, of the world's largest and most prominent ports, and we try to quantify the turnover, which is how many days a ship has to wait um, uh, for it to get to the port and um, go back. Uh, to to the to the next destination. So basically, what you see here is a satellite imagery of one of the ports that we track, and another uh, image that I have here is um, uh, one of the uh, ports again, Los Angeles and Long Beach. And we looked into uh, the turnover time, uh, how many days, uh, as well as the foot traffic. Again, foot traffic would give us an indication of okay, how many workers are at this port and how quickly a port can um, have the turnover. So what you see here is tracking from March of 2018. You see the wait time at this port is almost uh, from four days to eight days, almost, almost twice what it was before pandemic. And also foot traffic is so much down, which shows there are less workers working in this specific port. And again, like from investment perspective, there's a lot of implications of um, supply is disrupted, prices uh, would be impacted for certain industries who depend on uh, supply chain and import and export and so on. So uh, just um, an, an example here, and I move on to the next, and I know that uh, you can ask questions through chat if you want. Um, the second example that we have here is quantifying central bank communications. And again, just high level why we care about central bank communications when when probably you, you've heard um, in wherever you are that central banks are increasing or decreasing uh, the interest rate. And this is something that impacts almost every aspect of our life from our credit card to um, loans, interest rate to mortgage interest rate and, and um, to inflation, to the price of um, the um, 
different products that we use because interest rate is is basically the fundamentals of a country and how lending business is working. Um, so for, for Europe, there is a European Central Bank. And again, um, their communications are so important that every investor and every economist is tracking those communications to really understand the sentiment of the speech or press conference and to be able to predict whether they are going to increase or decrease the interest rate. And if you know that, you know, for example, at some point of time, maybe investment in um, uh, like fi fixed income is making uh, more money rather than investment in stocks and, and vice versa. So um, there's a lot of implications for investors based on what is happening within uh, central banks. And, and what we built here is a natural language processing engine that tries to um, look into the patterns of speech, tones, uh, words that are being used and how interest rates change over time with respect to those speeches and press conferences. And the machine is now able to quantify um, like the sentiment or what we call it in uh, investment world, that degree of hawkishness of the press conference or a speech. And um, again, what you see here is our numerical value, um, what we call it RBC ECBO meter versus the, um, the interest rate in Europe. And you see that it nicely tracks um, the, the ups and downs of the interest rate and is actually being used to predict what is going to happen in Europe in terms of um, central bank decisions with respect to interest rate in Europe. Uh, an example of how we are utilizing natural language processing as well as um, uh, machine learning predictive modeling in our world of uh, investment uh, banking and investment research. And I move on to the next example, which is predictive, uh, uh, predictive models uh, that um, this very uh, specific example is predictive models for Canadian banks. And when you think about it, if you're investing in any security, for example, in banks, if you are holding uh, stocks of uh, different banks, um, uh, what is going to happen is uh, at the end of every quarter, uh, every organization, every public organization has to disclose their financial performance, what was the money that they made, and many different items that they report to their investors. Uh, in the case of banks, what is really important is their um, uh, loan balances and their loan book, because a lot of the money that banks make is, is actually based on how much money they lend to people through mortgages, credit cards, or to businesses, or uh, to corporations and so on. So the lending big business is really the big money make maker for the banks. And if you are able to predict what the bank's loan book would look like uh, next quarter, um, uh, it's very highly associated with the performance of the stock. Um, what we did here, we built predictive models for balances of loans in major Canadian banks. And uh, the models are um, linear, not linear, I mean, uh, the models are like complex regression models, not, not too complex, but still we incorporated a lot of um, different um, components like the past performance, um, some real-time data and so on to be able to um, predict the performance of the loans in every bank in Canada. And again, this is something that, it, that we publish to our investors and they um, use that to make decisions regarding buying or selling uh, the stocks of these banks ahead of um, their quarterly announcements. Um, um, yeah, the, the accuracy of these models have been really amazing um, in terms of percentage error between 0 0.021 to 0 0.036, which is below even half a percentage uh, error, which is uh, really amazing in terms of the prediction uh, performance. And the next example that I have is um, uh, we looked at, um, again, uh, for um, a lot of securities that we cover, the um, companies are consumer facing. If you think about, for example, Hershey, that they have chocolates and different snacks, and um, there was um, some announcement um, uh, some time ago that um, some of these uh, consumer companies announced that they are increasing the price of one of their products. 
And again, it, um, just I wanted to uh, make this um, really relatable. So this this example is is they're they're increasing the price of their chocolate candy, as simple as that. And obviously, when they increase the price, your expectation as an investor is okay. They will, they are going to make more money, and uh, eventually, probably a stock is going to perform even better. Uh, than before, but in this case, what we did, we looked into the price elasticity, which means sometimes when you increase the price of one object, um, uh, like consumers, they don't consume it as much anymore, and they shift to another another uh, basically uh, item. In this case, what we looked at uh, for chocolate candy and uh, to see if there is any price elasticity with any other snack. Um, in 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 the within the snacking world, and you see a lot of positive um, correlation between non chocolate candy, dried meat snacks, and salty snacks. And basically, this what this shows is uh, it, this shows that when um, a company increases the price of one category like chocolate, people tend to consume other stuff because they realize that oh, the price of chocolate is up. Let's let's go buy some chips, for example. Um, so this this is like the type of um, uh, insights that would be really valuable for investor not to jump uh, into a conclusion when a company announces price increase of one object, etc. So uh, basically, an interesting uh, way of looking at how um, the uh, elasticity between demand and prices are working. And. Uh, my next next example is a standalone data product, and again, here I wanted to uh, showcase that sometimes the data alone is very valuable, and even if you don't do any predictive modeling and anything like that, this is a, a product that we built over years. We are tracking uh, home builders, largest home builders in the U.S. Um, uh, for a couple of years now, um, and this basically accounts for 35 percent of uh, new home sales in the U.S. Uh, we started collecting this data in 2018. And as you can imagine, we have three years of history of what every builder is building, um, like a hyper-local data of, okay, every single floor plan that they are building. Uh, what is the price? What is the spec? And this gives us a lot of information, not only on the builder. And again, all of these builders are um, publicly traded stocks that uh, investors buy and sell, but also on the market. Like, for example, you may see that uh, California market is actually cooling down and Texas market is cooling, is, is, is uh, becoming hotter um, after pandemic and so on. So, so again, a lot of information with regards to for uh, what you see here in this picture, for example, how many um, uh, this is across all builders, not a specific one. How many floor plans have seen increased month over month of prices? How many decrease and how many flat? And in, even in terms of the specs of the how, homes, how many homes um, are larger or, or smaller or the same spec as before? A lot of um, uh, interesting insights for investors, again, to make decisions which one of the builder, builders have a better future and um, uh, they can uh, make decision uh, in terms of what to buy and what to sell, as well as um, all the implications for the housing market for different regions and different uh, parts of the US. And um, uh, the next example that I have is again, when I talked about alternative data, which is not uh, financial data that we are using in our studies. This is again, a great example of that. We are using satellite imagery to track um, uh, oil storage across um, uh, different markets, uh, oil markets, basically. You see here, like uh, China, Japan, South Korea, um, like different um, Arabic countries and so on. And basically, this is something that we work with um, one of our partners, uh, vendor partners um, outside RBC and uh, they um, uh, collect and combine 200 um, and the data from 200 different satellites and they create a real time view into uh, where the oil market is heading. Obviously, oil prices is um, such a fundamental um, uh, like financial market in every um, everywhere in the world defining a lot of prices and uh, the direction of the movement of uh, other commodities and so on. So basically, um, with this product, we are tracking um, in real time where the oil market is heading 
um, if uh, we weren't do, doing this, like um, uh, the um, uh, data that these countries release is at best monthly or quarterly. And uh, by the time that they're, they're, they release the data, the price of the commodity, the oil itself, is reflective of uh, what they have been uh, disclosing. Uh, but with real time, like you, you can get ahead of that and you can um, uh, really make money by, by um, knowing what is going on with oil storage. Uh, whether the supply is increasing or decreasing and how it would impact the prices in real time. And finally, the last example that I have is another um, alternative data, uh, social media. And again, this is very important and we're utilizing social media insights for a lot of our projects where um, uh, the um, company or the product is consumer facing. In this case, we looked into Apple and when they wanted to launch their new iPhone, we looked into how many times it is being mentioned, whether it was positive or negative. And then really it's it's correlated with uh, the sales that Apple has on their iPhone because you can imagine people go on um, Twitter and Reddit and uh, uh, everywhere and they talk about their experiences and whether it was positive, negative, and it uh, has impact overall on the company and, and their sale. Um, this is, again, another example of alternative data, non-financial data that we are using in finance to make predictions of uh, what's going uh, to happen for the companies. Um, that was uh, all of my examples. I, I pause here and i um, happy to answer any questions you may have. And I stop sharing so uh, we can uh track chat as well i don't see any question on the chat uh but um yep um uh, let me know if there is anything All right, I can see 183 people in the room. Great to see. And okay, thank you. All right, if there is no question, shall we conclude the session? Okay, we have one question. How do you know the correlation between delays in supply chain movements and actual prices? That's a great question. Uh, it really depends on what industry we're talking about. Um, like let's say in auto industry, when there is a lot of dependence on the imports from other countries, Etc. Uh, we haven't actually looked into the exact correlation between um, supply chain movements and prices. Um, so at this point, our focus is to quantify what has been the bottlenecks and how it is trending over time and whether um, the delays that we've seen since the start of the pandemic uh, is becoming better or worse. And then I guess from there, we have to do a dip down into different sectors that are really dependent um, in shipping industry and in the import and see if uh, and how prices has been impacted. And as you probably have heard in the news, there's a lot of um, increases in prices of auto, for example, because of the um, uh, lack of chips and um, other other uh, basically factors that that uh, impact prices. Uh, but that's um, really something that we have to look at more closely from quantitative perspective after uh, we finish quantifying all the delays and uh, turnover times in all the ports. Of course. <laughs> what is your favorite part of your job? Um, I guess um, a, a lot of things, 
uh, are, are really exciting within capital markets. One of the most exciting ones is uh, when we see uh, the interaction of clients and how they utilize the insights that we generate for their investment decisions. A lot of our studies actually end up to be in the news um, and we market it really heavily. And then from there seeing that our clients took an action and they sold or they bought a security or an asset classes because of our recommendation is actually uh, very exciting. And I really love that part. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what are you most excited about in the AI space right now? Um, some my, my personal favorite field within AI is, is actually natural language processing. And there are a lot of developments there in terms of chatbots and um, uh, real-time applications that uh, do real-time. Um, uh, everyone has used Siri or... Uh, other applications, voice applications, and then you talk, it um, captures and immediately responds back. And I think that's one of my exciting and favorite areas overall um, processing of language and uh, text, uh, because numbers, everyone can somehow make sense of numbers. But when you go to text, when you go to voice, it is much more difficult to uh, make sense of words really and um, like the application that I showed in terms of um, uh, quantifying central bank speeches and communications was really an exciting one for us because there was no other bank that did something similar and they were able to quantify um, like something that is really not quantitative it's it's mostly qualitative that's very exciting Thank you. Has your work focus changed since the pandemic? Yes, it did. Um, so before pandemic, uh, a lot of our projects were similar to what you saw on, on the banking side, predicting performance of the companies really. But when pandemic happens, our focus changed to be a lot on uh, macro and tracking the impact of COVID, we are now tracking congestions in different cities to see how things change. We are tracking air pollutions to see how things change. And again, like uh, uh, we, we are doing less work on companies specifically, but more on a macro and what impacts all the market, all the commodities, all the securities because of things like uh, supply chain disruption, um, shortage of workers, and um, more and more macro things rather than focusing on one single company or stock. All right, what is your advice for students? I would say uh, be curious, uh, try to embrace innovation um, there's hope, uh, there's innovation happening everywhere now in banking, in all industries, AI and data science in a, is an exciting field to be at, uh, but everything else is also going through a lot of disruptions and innovations and just having a curious mind, embracing the change, trying to always, always learn. Uh, if you think about AI, it's, it's a never ending um, journey for a data scientist or a AI specialist to learn new techniques every day. There is something new that comes up. So my advice is, is just to embrace that and uh, uh, try to be on the path of always learning and always changing. Uh, what studies, degrees, sorry, something pop up here. Um, or experiences you got to where you are now in your career. Um, my, uh, my, uh, uh, so my own personal journey was probably a little bit different. I, I thought that, uh, I always thought that I would end up in academia. I did my uh, master's and PhD here in Canada 
And um, my field was actually medical robotic, didn't have anything to do with banking or finance. Uh, but then I realized that I actually love building models and looking at the data and running statistics more than just the robotic side. So when I um, was towards the graduation of my PhD, I started looking for jobs and I ended up in RBC and I thought, okay, I will leave RBC probably in a year. And, and here I am five years later and I don't have any plan to leave. So I guess you never know where your journey ends and uh, um, all of your past experiences somehow shape uh, where you go. Uh, for me, it was mostly the analytics that I've uh, done in my PhD, a lot of modeling that I did within the world of robotics and uh, um, medical robotics that ended up helping me and a lot of um, that that vision that you get from doing a deep dive research into one narrow field that you do uh, when you are doing PhD. Although I, I don't say that people need to have PhD to come to industry and uh, do what I do now, but for me it was uh, a great journey to go through that um, being focused in something that is really extraordinary and very narrow and very niche uh, to utilize that expertise and come to bank and then um, apply it to something that is absolutely different. Thank you. What do you see as your next step in your career? I think for uh, us within Capital Markets, we have a lot of plans to expand on the utilization of AI and alternative data in all parts of our businesses. At the moment, we are mostly utilizing this within investment uh, research. That's uh, what I showed in different use cases and examples. But uh, AI and the data science and alternative data can be applied in other parts. So uh, for me, I think the exciting thing is, is we are going to expand and have more impact and uh, be more involved in other lines of businesses. And hopefully from there, there would be a lot more um, engagements, uh, use cases, projects that would be exciting for me and my team. What was your biggest learning at work? Uh, biggest learning, I guess, for me, um, when I joined RBC, I was part of the technology team, and uh, it was uh, a fairly um, smooth transition for me from academia to the technology. We um, surrounded with a lot of technical people. And when I joined Capital Markets, uh, it was a different environment. It was mostly non-technical business people uh, um, were people who I was working with. And it was a little bit different and more difficult when I joined them. So for me, the biggest learning was how to interact with um, business people, non-technical audience, and how to bring uh, different innovations to people who have been running a traditional business and they haven't seen anything like this or they don't understand what AI is and um, really learning how to speak to them and how to deliver projects of impact to a non-technical audience was, was really my biggest learning.
Any other question? I think that's all the questions that we have for now, but I want to thank you so much for coming. I want to thank all of the students that came and are watching the talk. Thank you so much. We have lots going on in the RBC Discord channel, so please come over. We have mentors available for all of you, and we do have uh, some job postings up right now, and our Amplify job posting is opening on Monday. So lots to come for all the students. Come and visit RBC throughout the day in our Discord channel. Thank you everybody so much for attending. Thank you everyone. Have a good day and enjoy. Your Thank, you. Day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.